So, so that, yes. That opens up a, a thing to consider. And I already said it once, but I was just going to say it over and over again. And Richard's accused me of playing with fire. But I want to I want to say to Richard, we we as humans do control burns. Once in a while they get out of hand, but we do control burns. And I play with fire in that I encourage aphids. I encourage aphids in situations where I know that they're they're brassica aphids or they're um, goldenrod aphids, you know, they're specific aphids, and I know that the crop that's going to be following is solanacea or something like that. The aphid is really not going to boom on that on that very different plant. And that greenhouse, all winter long, we grew brassica. We had flowers in there, but the truth is, you don't get too many flowers in March. I mean, they just don't flower that much, you know. We had bad, we had some great ones that flower early, bachelor buttons, they have extra floral nectaries and stuff. So we had nectar. But the main thing, the main, I mean, literally, Richard, I remember being amazed. There were so many ladybugs, they were eating their own eggs. They were, they were laying their eggs on the walls of the greenhouse. I mean, they were, their density was so incredible. You know? And it was because of aphids, tons of food. You know? Right. So that, that's the thing to remember is that it's, you, know, you don't freak if you see aphid populations. You stop and you think, does this population matter to me? There are times when it's windy, you don't do a controlled burn. You know? Right. But you, you understand what a controlled burn is. You can play with fire. Okay, so we get him. <laughs> Let's just take a couple plants that I really like. I really like fennel. I like bronze fennel. I like regular fennel. I can sell it. I pickle. I make. Uh, I'm I'm growing cucumbers. So my fennel. That's a farmscaping plant that gets all my beneficials in here. You can see. Here's a C, <coughs> C7 ladybug right here. There's four main types of ladybugs, which we'll go over. In, well, we have them on Dr. McBug. I don't know if we can get to the web. If we can get to the web, we can do it. So the thing here, as you think about this, is fennel is great for getting parasitic wasps because it's an umbel. It has those little tiny flowers, and little tiny flowers are really important for parasitic wasps. So baby's breath, coriander, any of the umbels become very important when you are trying to encourage a big population of parasitic wasps, okay? Surfid flies, which are these little, you know, little green and brown maggots that eat aphids, those are good. And so one plant, even though we don't like to depend on this, and I'll tell you that I don't totally depend on fennel, I use a lot of it though. I use tons of it and it's edible. I'm all the time putting it in egg salad, tuna salad, you know, I mean, it's just got uses. And so this is the kind, when you guys think about the kind of farmscaping you're gonna do, Work backwards from what you're already doing, and if you're growing cucumbers, grow fennel. You got your pickling spice you can sell at the market along with, you know, that's what the way we do things here is we try to make everything an effective addition. Do you want to get a chef to pay attention to you? I just did a detective from um, salsas, right? And I was touring through this garden. He came up to the fennel, and I just took a flower and said, so Hector, you just, Hector just got a farm. I said, you have this fennel grower? I cannot fathom how much chefs pay for fennel pollen. It's all the rage, right? I mean, can you imagine collecting pollen? I mean, how much per ounce? I mean, I don't even want to think about it, right? But if you have your own farm, you cut the fennel, right? You got some nice flowers sitting on the, on the bar. You want some fennel pollen on a dish? You go cut a flower, you come back, and you shake it over your food. You have fennel pollen all over your food. He was just like, wow. And you just save him a bunch of money, and yeah. it's probably the best fennel pollen he's ever had because it's fresh. As as it can be, right. There's no work. It's always there. You got it. If you, if you don't use it, it just keeps, keeps on decorating the, um, the bar. So. Right. And that's the way to think about all this. If you're, if you're doing this and trying to make money, your farmscaping should never cost you. It always pays you in many ways. All of these plants are multifunctional. Right. Loads of uses. Right. <clears throat> Back to broccoli again, because we did a lot of work on broccoli. Oh, the thing I got to tell you guys, the first year that we did that grant, we grew, harvested, and sold 21,753 pounds of broccoli. And I know because I cut just about every piece of it. Not all of it, but I did, there was 8,000 pounds I didn't cut. Jewel Moro down, at, down by uh, Canton down there uh, cut 8,000 pounds of his. Now, 
I want to show you this because here's an old broccoli plant or this could be one of your other crucifer plants and it's got these parasitic wasp cocoons on it. If you till them under, you're going to kill them. So you can do one of two things. You could either take a row and leave it until the spring till you see the cocoons pop out because what will happen is there will be a cocoon and the end will pop open. It looks just like a capsule that's just popped open. And then you know you can go on ahead and till that. Or you can do what I would do is I'd go around and just grab these, get a big bundle of them, and just go throw them up in a corner of the field, and then I could till everything else under. And when I was taking this picture, I was only looking at those cocoons there. And later on, I noticed there's another mass of the same. This is uh, called Coetzea glomerata. This is the one that gets an imported cabbage worm and pops out of it like the alien all over. Okay. So, don't just think about what's going on right now. You've got to make that bridge between the end of this season and next spring. And if you keep these high populations, if you can ride herd on the first generation of these multi-generation insects, you got them whipped. If you don't have control of them in the first generation or so, then you're going to be playing catch up and spraying BT and neem or whatever, you know. To, uh, to control this stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a thing I can... to consider here. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, bit of a um, paradox for us as good growers because you're holding over that broccoli, right? You're also probably holding over Alfinaria if you're a typical farm around here. So what you want to do is pay attention. When you've seen that those beneficials have passed out and stuff, then you do get that residue, get it to your compost pile, get it hot, clean it up. You don't want that source of those spores later on when it gets hot and humid. Those guys are long gone by the time it's hot and humid. So you let it go early, but then you do clean it up. You know? But it used to be, I always believed, and it was like, it was a ritual every, every fall, totally clean the garden. Nothing left from the year before. Right, it's nice and clean. all bad stuff. Not true. It's a mix. Right. You just don't have black and white in the world. So you have to do that dance. You have to do that balance. You know? And then two other great ones that likewise are wonderful arborage for overwintering insects are comfrey and yarrow. Yep. Because of their structure, those leaves, right? They lay, the way they layer, perfect place for both the, the pest and the beneficial. You have to get that. And we're not saying this is how you get rid of pests. You get rid of pests and you're in big trouble. You get, you want, you know, this is how you get your pest in control and balance. Right? You want to tip the scales in your favor, but you know, I am telling you, if you were growing commercially like we were doing, you know, what, uh, Charles was right. Charles, you know, in Charles was right to have that field sprayed, even though we had gotten it all the way there, you know, and proved to him. His wife was coming out to me uh, throughout the whole season and going, and coming out and being really nice to me and going, would you like some tea? I feel so sorry for you because this is not going to work, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Deb, I got a surprise for you a little bit later on. And see, even as an organic grower, we always spray our broccoli once, you know. And we right. spray it right as it's cupping. That's right. The beneficials have a hard time getting inside the flower. And so you end up with gorgeous broccoli, your plants look great, boy, you aced it, and then your customers, your CSA members, this happened to me, right. grab a spray one, cook that broccoli, and there's a green worm in there, boy. It doesn't work. Right. You know? So once you do spray, it's not like we say never spray, but you learn when right. to dynamically use those sprays and not right. try the beneficials of their, of their food sources and their nurseries so you have the next layer next um, generation of beneficial. And so he, he's making a really important point, and this is a trick that we use when you're, when, and, and I'm kind of focusing on broccoli here just because it was, you know, one of the things that we really worked on a lot. But when those plants cup, right when that head's a little button head, if you spray then, nothing can develop. It's two weeks from the time of, of you have a broccoli that's buttoned like that to the time it's like that. There's no caterpillars or anything that can develop that fast that I've ever seen, at least up where we are. Now, it's a little warmer down here, and you guys might have, you know, I mean, I'm up in, supposed to be the coldest spot in North Carolina. I don't know about that anymore. Okay, and the other reductionist thing that I'd say, because we're at these meetings and people are always wanting to know what percent, all right? Well, really, do as much farmscaping as you can do for the reduction people that I talk about, somewhere between 1% to 5%. And one of the things that we do and is commercially available are various uh, farmscaping mixes that you can drive over. So if you've got a takeout row, you've got a, you know, you've got a row every seventh or eighth row in a big field, for those of you that, are, that have big stuff, then you could take and make that your, your farmscaping and you didn't, 
you, you know, you didn't sacrifice any of your planting field for that, okay? Two tricks that, um, that we use here, um, and Kenny Haynes actually, I love, he, on the bigger scale, he did it too. Um, what Kenny would do is, big farm, right, hundreds of acres, lots of roads, but you hardly ever drive on them. Once the crops are in there, there could be weeks and weeks before you drive on them again, right? He sowed them all the buckwheat. If he had to drive on, he drove over the buckwheat, killed some, put the stuff all between roots. Then if he had a pest problem, what did he come to? Mow those roads, where the pests just go into his fields. Right. What do we do here? We're sowing winter cover crops, right? We're mixing buckwheat into our winter cover crops. We always do. I mean, that's stupid, right? We're raising seed. They're going to freeze. It's not going to work, right? But buckwheat this time of year, it goes to flower this tall. Right. You know? And so we have huge amounts of nectary, of food sources for our beneficials because we wasted a little bit of, quote, quote, wasted a little bit of our buckwheat seed, you know? And maybe a bunch of it will freeze and not get to flower. So what? Another trick that we've used with buckwheat, which Brinkley Benson taught us, was if you've got buckwheat up where it has two nodes and it's bloomed, you can weed eat it, and then it'll bloom again. So we would have cut and come again buckwheat. It'd go bloom, we'd cut it, about three weeks later it'd bloom again, we'd cut it back down where it still had those two nodes. We just had, uh, well, let's see, we would put that stuff out actually in March. So the first bloom cutting would be 45 days later. You know, I mean, that's basically it. Now, you can, if you let it reseed, it'll just stay there. You know that. But, you know, and, and I don't think of buckwheat as too much of a weed. You know, I mean, it's one of the, it's easy to control. You can't control yeah. buckwheat. You've got some serious Yeah. <laughs> now, mugwort, you know, we can talk about yeah, some other. Well, ah, okay. And the other thing, too, to remember is if you've got ditches or fence rows or stuff like that, those all make great uh, harborage areas. And so here's where the rubber meets the road. Most insects that we're interested in as far as beneficials meet and mate at flowers. Flowers are the disco of the insect world, okay? So, you know, we, we see right here, you've got a mating pair of, this is Coetzea rebecula. This is another parasitic wasp that attacks um, imported cabbage worm. Where do we find them? We find them on brassica flowers, so we would always let a little bit of our broccoli go. People drive by and go, you let that roll of broccoli go. It's like, yes, we did that on purpose. Drive off, okay? but. I'm going to tell you something that we learned. This is where Virginia Tech and these other institutions have really come through. We were able to show that if you had a well-fed, mated female wasp, she would lay 10 times more eggs, 10 times more eggs than if she's poorly fed. So the same kind of problems that we have with pests where they lay eggs like crazy, we can turn around and take our beneficials and feed them real well and you don't have a normal wasp anymore. You've got a super wasp that will attack tons of pests in your field, way far beyond what most normal insects would, okay? And once again, you remember down here where we had that thing with the greenhouse where we use that to, to jumpstart our insects, okay? One of the other things that becomes really important, and we'll go out here shortly because we're just about at the end of this and see this in action out in the field is nectar. And I don't just mean nectar from flowers. I like tulip poplars. Now this, this is for the tiffia wasp that attacks Japanese beetles. We figured out that this tree was where we could collect these wasps and move these wasps, okay? <clears throat> so, as we said again, three to tenfold more eggs laid if these things have been fed well. Okay, so, and, and remember, it's not just flowers. These trees bloom out here. I've got a uh, holly, and the holly's blooming right now, and it's covered in beneficials. So there's all this, these shrubs and different things, and it, this is just a matter of observing, okay? So here's some of this work that I did in China. I went to China 12 to 14 times. I can't remember how many times I went. This is my buddy, Hung Yin, who worked with me at the uh, Beneficial Insect Lab in Raleigh. This is peanuts. When I got there, I thought they said it was red hemp. So, of course, I'm a hippie. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven here, you know. But 
What this is is Kanaf, okay? This is Kanaf going all the way around the edge of this field. But this is a food plant for those tip tiffia wasps. And these guys would introduce a certain amount of wasps. They introduce one wasp to 10 grubs. They know how many grubs are in their fields. They introduce this with Kanaf and some other uh, food plants they have, like sweet potato. And we get control. Now, this is just the corner edge of the field. I just, you know, it comes out here bigger, but I just wanted to show you guys. Uh, those are nectar glands that are not associated with flowers. So they're extra floral nectaries, and a lot of plants have extra floral nectaries. Bachelor Buttons has extra floral nectaries. Sweet potato, at the base of every sweet potato leaf, there's two little sugar nectaries. That's cowpeas. Yes, any, a lot of your legumes. Yeah. It's, so you grow your cover crop, you get the benefit of the cover crop, and you feed your beneficiaries. All right. 